Mrs. Newton, who owned her family home, the Shaw House, was very distressed because it was going to be sold, the property, and a gas station put there. And she cherished very much the house. She'd been asked several times to um, sell her mantles. Actually, um, Mrs. Biddle, Livingston Biddle's wife in Pinehurst, his first wife, his second wife, had come over and asked her to sell the mantle in the what is now called the parlor. And uh, she was going to give her $1,500. Well, in 1946, that was quite a price for a, a wooden mantle. And um, she said no, she would not disturb the house in any way. So my memory of the house was in 1922 or 21, when I came both years with my mother and stayed in the old house in Pine Thin. And we used to go down to the Shaw House for tea. Uh, a man had taken, a woman rather, had taken it over as a tea room, rented the whole business. And um, we would sit by the fire and drink tea, it was very pleasant. So I said, well, I, to Mr. White, you know, I, I just can't conceive of that house going. <clears throat> we must do something about that. You see, at this time, the North Carolina Society of Preservation of Antiquities was going full tilt. It would become very popular under the leadership of Mrs. Charles A. Cannon, of the um, great um, textile magnet. She lived in Concord, North Carolina. She was very keen on the restorations in Virginia and Maryland. So she wanted North Carolina to catch up. And she was working on this and president of the society. Her vice president, her congressional district had vice presidents, each one. The vice president for this district was living in Eagle Springs. He was George Maurice a retired um, uh, engineer from New York, very wealthy, aristocratic, delightful man. And um, so I jumped in my car as soon as I could and drove over to see Mr. Maurice. And I said, George, this is pretty terrible. This sh that Shaw House is going to be sold. And he said, well, I can't imagine. You mustn't let that happen. Now, we must form whatever kind of a group we can and to save it. So you go back to Pinehurst, get Leland McKeithen, the lawyer, who later became a judge, uh, and um, get him and his father as a historian. This county was rich, having two very intellectual, accurate, intelligent, generous men. And it was Edwin McKeithen and Rassy Wicker, whom I'm sure you've all heard of. Now, Rassy Wicker was the engineer for Mr. Tufts. So he had to run the lines for all these properties he was buying. He knew every inch, I might say, of Moore County. He went to Fayetteville to see many records because the courthouse in, Fayette, in the Carthage had been burned long ago. And so some of the early records were not there. He knew all these properties and their owners. So when we told him about the Shaw House, uh, he said, well, we can't have this happen. Well, we met in the library, a group of us. Uh, Mr. Um, Maurice really guided me because he knew more about the people here. He lived longer, and he had great interest. So we had the postmaster, Mr. Frank Buchan. We had Mrs. McPherson um, uh, from Cameron, as I remember, Catherine Boyd. Uh, we had um, uh, Talbot Johnson from Aberdeen, whose father had been a, come here after the Civil War. And we had, there's a group, a nice little representative group. From Carthage, we had Clyde Shaw, who was the postmaster, and he'd been postmaster for years up there. His sister, Kate Shaw, they had both been, come from this Shaw House family, but they lived in Carthage. And then we, we saw to it that we had all districts represented. And uh, then we met in Southern Pines Library, and that's where we met usually for several years. The meetings were always very gay and amusing, very interesting people came. But that formation meeting, it was decided that we must have a Moore County Historical Society. And Mr. Maurice said, now you go to the telephone, call up Christopher Crittenden, who was the archivist and really the director of the Department of Archives and History in Raleigh, and ask him what he can do for us if we form and how should we do it. So, lo and behold, I did, took my orders and got him on the phone. And he said, well, we, the Antiquities Society, could only give you $100 because we don't have much. We're trying very hard to save many places. But you should form. He told us just how to do it. Well, we did it. We had our first meeting there, and then we 
we got going with the president and the vice president and the secretary and the treasurer and that, I guess that was about it. Arnett Avery, Wastel Avery's descendants, uh, wife. She was a very bright woman, very amusing. Um, Ar uh, Arnett Avery gave a great deal of um, interest to this thing because she was a native and also her husband uh, was a native. Now, Frank Buchan was a native, you know, uh, weak newcomers, like Catherine Boyd will say, and we think of the Boyd family as an old family here, but they really weren't. We're talking about the native North Carolina because we were doing a native house. Um, you see, the county is split. The north end of the county is the clay, or the clay people as we call them. And then um, this end was the sand people, the sand and the Scots. The first, um, the, actually, the first recorded grant in Moore County in this area, 1746, and it was for a man uh, named Armstrong. Now, the, his origins are unknown, uh, but the next one who became a real resident was John and his brother Thomas Richardson. And they came in 1747, and they are still on their land, and it's up near the Bryant House. Now, and the McClendon cabin, now all of these little rivers and all of these high roads were given the names of the settlers. If they were, you see, look at the old maps, and you see the McClendon Road, you see the McClendon Creek, now we say the McClendon Cabin, uh, uh, and the, the Morganton Road, the P.D. Road is where they crossed right by the Shaw House. So the story was, as we got deeper and deeper into the history of the county, we knew them. Uh, we realized there was a split between the North and the South. We heard the stories. Mr. Maurice, for instance, told me that in the north end of the county, they were very isolated. The roads were almost impassable for half the year with the, of the mud, uh, I mean, the, you know, the wet sand and clay and they couldn't get out. They weren't wealthy. They didn't have carriages. They had a horse or a mule or whatever. And to get down to Carthage twice a year to court was a big event for them and to get there for market. So the buckskins, as they were called, because they wore buckskin jackets, would come down spring and fall. And then there was a lot of drinking and a lot of, of exchange of goods at Carthage. That was the county seat. Of course, that's where the famous battle took place up on Deep River in our county. We were split off from um, split at the time Lee was born, but that was very recent times. Well, of course, as the history unfolded at all these historical meetings, the local people could get interesting men to come and talk to us. One time there was a man named McQueen, and I cannot forget this man. He was elderly. He was still with a little burr in his speech. Uh, he told of the uh, past coming uh, over Scotland, the first people who came could bring practically nothing. There was a choice for the wife to bring a little trunk with her precious belongings, or the husband to bring an axe and a gun, and it was just about that down. Now we have in the Shaw House today one of those little boxes. Mrs. Boyd, luckily, always had an eye for these old things, and she, had, she got it from an old settler, and it was the very little box that his wife had brought her possessions in, and it's about two feet long and about a foot deep, and we have it in the in that parlor. It's hand-painted and hand-forged, ha hand um, you know, um, latches and so on. Now, as we learned about these people, we got more and more curious about the upper end of the county. Because he were, we were living in hotels or houses, it was all very modern. The, the, what, it was the period when North Carolina had awakened to preservation, when the society had been formed to save the old things, James Boyd was the first vice president. And posthumously, he got the Canon Silver Cup Award. His son went up to receive it in uh, the annual meeting in Raleigh. Well, I must say that from this curiosity that was growing on our part, Save something beside the Shaw House, which we were all working madly for. I, some of the happiest days of my life were spent there in the spring. I think it's the first time I recall listening, really listening, to a mockingbird. I was working in those grounds because it all had to be cleaned up. It had been a um, junkyard. 
on that where the charming little the garden is, um, uh, there was so much iron you couldn't believe it. They just tossed iron scrap in there. We took away truckload after truckload. And then uh, the house, having been a tea room for a time, had one or two partitions changed. The old part of the house, you know, stops when you go down the step, the new wing at the back. That was put on after the Civil War. You could see that those people had an eye for architecture. That there are very high ceilings in the Shaw House. Also, you'll see all the boards on the original Royal House are horizontal. And where the new ones were put in, uh, they're <laughs> just the opposite. Uh, uh, in the year 17, uh, I mean, not, see, we got started, as I recall, in 1946, well, let's say it's 47, to be safe, because the first annual meeting was ordered by Razzie Wicker at the house in the Horseshoe and the grave of Governor Williams. Well, of course, we had no idea where we were going. And I can remember vividly, uh, it was an April day, and this is William D. Campbell was living here then, the lady who gave her house, uh, the Campbell house, to, to the city. And she took a car load, I took a car load. Of course, my husband was keen about this too, but I was the really active one. He was busy with his farm most of the time. But he came down to the show house and helped. All right, we all got in our cars and we drove, we didn't know where. We were going to heading for Carthage first. Then we had to take a dirt road, which was a charming old winding road to get up Deep River. We were going first to the grave of Governor Williams. We didn't really know much about Governor Williams. We didn't know that he was a member of the Constitutional Congress. We didn't know he'd been four times governor, the first man to plant cotton in Moore County, and that he was a very distinguished character. Well. We had to stop and ask this and ask that, and then they'd say, well, you fork at the old Harrington place. Well, where was the Harrington place? We suddenly saw a big white house on the left, you know, two-story, looked more Victorian than colonial. And we decided we'd ask there. And then finally we all arrived, and it was a little snaky road up into the forest. And we, I really mean a rough road. Well, we got there, and here were these magnificent great slabs on the ground, Governor Williams, his wife, and his son. Well, you know, we were so amazed, and the talk was so clear and so interesting and thrilling to us when Mr. McKeithen told the story. Then he said, now we're going over to his house. Well, none of us had been to the house in the horseshoe. We didn't know a thing about it. So we crossed the river on a shaky little bridge, got to the house in the horseshoe, and here was a chicken farm with a large chicken house right beside the old manor house. It was a great long structure, and chickens, chickens, chickens. Apparently the county was just beginning its great, you know, war effort, really. They made chickens their big crop. So we got the Mr. Landrup, a great character, who was living, he was the tenant for Mr. Hancock, who owned the place. He came out, and he was very surly. He wasn't very pleased with us, but we all stood because of nothing to sit on. And Rassy Wicker stood on the steps of that house, and in his enchanting, strange manner, he gave us the story of the battle, the story of Alston, and the story, again, of Governor Williams, who had owned it. You know, I can just see the whole setting. We tried to have it enacted later, not by human, but by men, but we had a group, we did a little play. We had Mrs. Williams there because the story, the historical fact, I think, is that she put her children on a table in a chimney so they wouldn't be struck by bullets. And she was the heroine, of course, in the end, because she came out with some kind of white cloth and waved it to have Fanning stop shooting at the house. Because at that point, they had brought up a rick of hay. The, the Negro slaves had been ordered to bring this to the house and set fire. So as they saw this approach, this was the end. They couldn't take that. So she ran out and they stopped the battle. But there were several men killed on the property. Now, the graves, one or two of graves were discovered by one of the caretakers later. But I know, don't know just where. Also, we realized that we had in Rassie Wicker a rare, rare man. 
he not only knew the lines and who owned the properties and what had happened there, but he knew the flora. He knew every kind of plant that was growing. He could identify types of men known to that were naked. He could point to the um, to the um, privet, and he said that is a newcomer. That was brought in by Sefford. It was never here in the days of Williams and Olson. He knew all these things, and he was he, he knew about battles. He had a strange way of looking into the distance as he talked, and he chewed a little stick sometimes. Occasionally, he had a very handsome Indian striped face with a darkish skin. And he gazed off in the distance, chewing this little stick. And really, it was very fat. He was just like a, a play. This man was bringing to life all these characters because they lived for him. They were people with, we knew uh, from having researched their pasts and their ownings and their properties. Well, in any case, that was a memorable case. And we had many meetings. We had it up there on the porch after we'd restored the house. And when um, Donald Ross, who had been um, head of the Department of Conservation in the 50s. He came and made a marvelous speech one of the days. He talked about the early days he passed the law, had the law passed for uh, you know, um, um, fencing in your cattle, because up to then they were just roaming over the state. And suddenly it was decided this was not good. So Don Ross was not in, a, in good favor with some farmers. <laughs> But he was in favor with the politicians and with the historians. And a charming dear man. His wife became crippled, and I can remember his coming out faithful, cleaning her and helping her in, lifting the wheelchair to bring her into the house. He brought me lilies of the valley to plant. He brought Confederate violets, all kinds of things. He was a dear person. Well, this, the society went from year to year under the leadership of Leland McKeithen. Our meetings were very formal. We met in the library. We had to carry the chairs in ourselves. We had to place them where we wanted them. We had to do a lot of work in preparatory to the meeting. There was no nothing served, no food or drink. And uh, the head of the, the, the chairman was standing at the end of the room, and he'd say, very formally, and do I hear a motion? And then suddenly we'd pipe up. Usually we had a speaker, and many distinguished people came. One of them was Chalmers Davidson, who came down from Davidson College. He was a distant kinsman of mine, but he was um, perfectly delightful, talking about the houses in Old Mecklenburg. And of course, the, the um, Hezekiah Alexander House was one of the ones they were restoring at that time. <clears throat> and when I went out to see the old center church graveyards for my Stevenson kin are buried. Um, he came to meet us and take us over to Davidson College for lunch. He is an interesting man to have, and he's written several books, authentic historical novels about that area of North Carolina. He's still living. And, you know, it was just astonishing the people who wanted to come to talk. They were delighted. And we didn't open it to the public. It was just our historical group and the members. I think it was a quite a personal thing, and a great deal of um, a friendship went on. Now, there was always a rivalry between Pinehurst. Uh, Pinehurst was a great golfing center, and of course, uh, Jim Boyd was one of the people who used to laugh at golfers. He said, well, they'd pile out of these trains in the morning with their great bags and stuff, and but I don't know what he would have said about the carts lined up. They don't wouldn't walk to play golf. But uh, he thought the only sport, of course, was horses because he had the, he started the hunt. And that was bringing a hunting group into the Southern Times. And that group was not interested in the locale of who were the people who started it and how did they live and were they, were they seen on the streets even. And uh, they were a very interesting group because they were a very chosen group in those days. And it was a small hunt. I remember a great friend, very prominent woman from Chicago who was here hunting. And one day she said to me, you know, Jack Boyd will turn on you and point to you and say, we don't want you in the field tomorrow. If you aren't correctly dressed or don't have good hunting field manners. It was a very intriguing. Uh, it was a very small affair. And I tell you, the life was so completely different in those days. There were so many streets that were unpaved. Coming out to our farm, we came on a sandy road, a clay road. We couldn't even drive the pony up the hill for anybody who was in the cart with us. 
it was a it was all so different. My son went to the public school for the first two years we were here. Then he went away to school and ate it. And two or three boys, David Drexel went down there, and another boy who lived whose name I can't recall. But um, you know, to get into to more county, now for instance, there was Donald Ross, a late a native man from Jackson Springs. Mrs. McCall, who came up here from Bennettsville, South Carolina. She remembered going as a girl to the hotel in Jackson Springs for the waters. She said they would drive from Bennettsville, South Carolina, in horse and buggy to come to Jackson Springs to have a month for the waters. Mm -hmm. Now, dear Mr. Ross um, met my husband and me at the Cannon's beautiful place up in Blowing Rock one summer. We had flown in from Illinois in my brother's gubernatorial plane at the time he was governor. We had left Illinois in the afternoon to get there for the opening of the great outdoor drama that was being put on for the first time, it boomed. And we spent the night and a day or two because Mrs. Cannon each summer would give a great reception and have somebody extremely important from the national level from Washington there to give an address and come to this big reception. It was for the benefit and the publicity for the North Carolina Society of the Preservation of Antiquities, for which she was president so long. So we were there, we, and we, uh, we saw down, uh, the Rosses came up for that. And I remember what fun we all had in that old wooden hotel that housed everybody. Well, to go back to Moore County, I can only say that the next step for us, after we had finished the Shaw House, was to how will we publicize it? How will we get people to come and see it? And people would say to me, Father, why are you saving that little old house? What do you want to do with that little thing? I said, it's the sample of your forefathers and mine. They all came and lived in little houses. Where were the big houses? They were built maybe in late 1600, maybe early 17, possibly into 18, on the seaboard. They were not back here in the woods where the, uh, the average and the usual type of pioneer was coming. The Scots came into the into this area from Cross Creek. They came after the English who drifted down from Virginia to the north end of this county. And then came the Scots who were coming over in loads to, to, to uh, Wilmington. And they would branch out. I was told that many of them in the first, when they first arrived had no place to sleep. Or did they curl up with their little bundles on the wharf? Or did they, did they drift off into the sandy streets of the village that was forming? They said that they used to peel the bark from the giant pine trees and make a covering, something over them, in the Sonoy weather in that first winter. Now you could imagine the crude huts that were forming. And finally they were building these little log houses. But what did you do to have a log house? You had to have an axe. They had to have some kind of saw. I'm no authority on tools, but I know that you have to <laughs> have an instrument. And uh, how was the woman faring? Did she have a pig and a cow? How could she feed her little family? It, it's very fascinating, and you know they very seldom had slaves. But uh, the stories that I used to hear about the men hiding things in the swamps in the neighborhood, rather than let the soldiers, I mean, let them be uh, taken by the armies, and they themselves didn't want to be conscripted, so they would go out and hide. And once we went up, oh, Mr. Um, uh, Crittenden up in Raleigh had directed our historical society to get records from these different families, but every house we could go to, we should ask for their old land grants or what they would give us to prove their having dwelt there. And I remember driving down to a Mrs. Um, McLeod, the Mrs. Boyd, and that man was quite deaf and very, very old. His wife was very, very young. She was his second or third wife. The story was that his oldest son had been alive in the revolution. And uh, Catherine wanted to get a story from him, but she couldn't because he didn't hear enough. But he could talk, and he did quite a little talking that day. Then the next house we went to, was uh, south of here, and I can't remember whose it was, but the lady brought from under her bed a little shoebox, paper box, in which she had her sacred papers. 
And uh, I said, can't you give us, oh, no, no. And I said, well, would you let us take them to Raleigh? Oh, no, no, no. And finally, towards the end of the visit, she was weeping just a little because I told her they'd be put in a bank. And she said, well, no, she still didn't want to give them. And when I came back in the fall, the house closed first. Mm. And of course, those papers went. Well, Mr. Crittenden ex explained there are two, two people who destroy these things. The brides who come into a family who say, I want to get rid of all this stuff. And then the other, of course, is fire. Mm. Because there were terrific fires in this area. I remember driving up my child, oh, well, this will be 50, 55 years ago of driving up from Florida and seeing a great fire for miles as I was approaching because those those pine stumps that were left were fat were, and they would burn and burn slowly and then you'd see this horrible oh, sight. And my, my son who's now 60 remembers that. He said, I remember the fire we used to see. Well, we finally, after getting a little Shaw house, oh, you know, we had to go in there and peel off wallpaper and we, we didn't know whether to scrub off the, the green paint that was on the little parlor to get back to the bare logs. And one of our friends, Mrs. Lovering, whose husband had a large uh, plantation outside of, um, well, they, they called it, uh, finally, what did they call it? Well, that Derby. Uh, there was a man named Derby who came down from Washington who was running some property for these people. They were Boston family. The Tuckermans and the Loverings, they were very aristocratic, they were very charming, educated, worldly people. And they chose to live on the peach orchard. So they built delightful houses, and the men had fun being out of doors and doing a sort of frontier life in a civilized way. And not going through the hardships of the forefathers. And we'd see them socially, and they were part of the group that you read about when you take that book, Sand in My Shoes, that was so famous. And actually, the second or third year, we got onto the house in the horseshoe. That was a long, difficult problem. Mr. Um, Talbot Johnson was the lawyer for us. You see, we had a series of presidents, uh, some very interesting presidents. So when Talbot Johnson was working on this problem, I think he was the president. He was trying to get to the ownership of the house in the horseshoe. It changed hands so many, many times. You see, uh, actually, the, the list of owners of the house in the Shahorshoe is in our Moore County history. So a whole chapter given to that house and the different owners. It, uh, it's it, from colonial, earliest colonial times. There's a chapter called The Story of a House. And it, it uh, tells you who the owners were and what vicissitudes they went through. And uh, there was mining up there. You know, they thought there was uh, gold in the area. And the gold mine nearby, gold or whatever it's called. The, is it, what is the name of that? Well, I anyway, went up there. Well, so they thought all these things were going on. So that house had many owners. Also, we had um, Edward McKeith in this president. Now, there was another county historian. And you know, I can remember so well when he gave us the little table that's in the window of the parlor of the Shaw House. He said, this came from Blues Mountain, which is the mountain I see from these windows at Port Bragg. And um, he, um, the McKeithen family had a farm over there. This was the Bible table. There was nothing on it but a um, candle or a lamp and the Bible. And, and it went in that drawer. And no child was supposed to ever touch the Shaw House. I must say that they were all given. I can't think of anything really offhand unless it would be um, the kitchen uh, things. And the, uh, we, you see, the Busbys were alive at Jugtown. Jack Busby and his wife were artists originally in New York. They came from Raleigh, but they'd gone to New York. They came down to Carolina and they discovered these potters in that area, uh, you know, up, up near Seagrove. And they, they found this, the people were calling what they call pie dishes. And they were calling the little jugs that are green, um, uh, it was called tobacco spit, brown. And the funny names, but they were making their, their food, and some, called, some of them were called dirt dishes. Now, it's just a big saucer 
about eight inches in diameter and about two inches high. And they used them for about everything, baking something and so on. And then they were making jugs with a lid, called them bean jug. Now they made themselves a fortune out of this because I saw it being sold at Abercrombie and Fitch later. And they were very worldly people and they knew how to uh, advertise. So they lived very simply at Jugtown in a wonderful little house. And they sold this pottery and they gave you a wonderful line when you went. Now, we, we, we thought it would be very chic of us to put all Jugtown pottery in the show house. So we got a lot of it as gifts from the Dvuzkas. And it's still there. It's in the show house. Uh, the, the green frog skin stuff was what was used in the Civil War, I was told, for medicine junks. They had little stoppers, tops, lids, and uh, they were sealed on. And then uh, the other things, finally Mr. Busby became a little bit oriental minded, and he did white. And he, but he always, anything he potted, he put the B for Busby, and it would look like a B with his wings spread. And you'll see that on many of the gray pieces in blue, in a lovely color of blue, and it's lined. The bowl will be lined with blue. Uh, their early things were very fine. He even put a coat of arms in white on a big candlestick that was yellow. Uh, he was doing very interesting things. And the generals would come over, and people from Fort Bag, and Mrs. Busby would always say, she cooked her baked beans in this pot, and I put it in the hearth, and so forth. She'd give you the recipe. Well, I later spent the night up there, and I found they were cooked in the kitchen and then put in the heart. <laughs> but um, it was very amusing to go there and spend the night with her after Mr. Busby died, because here was a little wooden house with these very sophisticated people and playing the note of simplicity. And in their library was a wonderful collection of very fine books and some very good pieces of bric-a-brac or silver and they knew just where to throw an old blanket and just how to bring out an old glass of homemade wine. Well, you wondered. And that night she said to me, now, Buffy, I'm going to put you in this room next to mine and Jack is here. I said, oh, and gasped because I knew Jack had been under the ground for a year and a half. And she said, that jug on the bureau is Jack. Mm. Well, his ashes were there, all right, and then I have a restless night. That <laughs> was the last night I spent in Junktown, I don't know. But it was sold, unfortunately, to a man who really, really abused it. The state wanted to take it, and they got down there too late. And Mrs. Busby was ill, and she's very much neglected. And this very smart man named Marais had come to town and was dealing in antiques and so on. And he got up there and played the tune of sympathetic friend. And he would preserve Jugtown. So she left it to him. And when the state people came in, some of the writers and so on, who'd been very good friends with Busby, and wanted to take it over and make it, you know, a very yeah. interesting play, they couldn't get it. So then the potter, Mr. Owen, took on, and I don't know. Well, to go, to, to go back to the things in that Shaw house, Mrs. Howland, who had a lovely house on Highland Road, gave us our, our, some of our finest pieces. And they are so fine that Mr. Horton wanted them to, in that museum, Mesta, at Winston-Salem. Also, one of the tables uh, uh, that I had gotten um, and had left in Miss McIntosh's shop. And he came through town, stopped there to buy Moore County original pieces. And she said, this table, and he said, oh, that's perfect. And I had bought it. So she telephoned me and said, are you sure you want this table? And I said, I certainly do. And she said, well, I have another buyer. And I said, well, you can't sell it. And uh, it's in the house in the horseshoe, luckily. But in the Shaw house, these nice things came to us from people who wanted them saved. And they were put in that house with a story behind them as a rule and many pieces that we just impulsively bought or were given. And some of them from this house that I had bought for myself and Pondra don't have place for that, I'll take it to the house, and it suits. Now the bed on the porch, for instance, came from an old house in Upper Moore County, and it has a wonderful thing, it's a rope bed, and it has one of those um, slats. They're, they're, they're woven, a woven slat of white oak, split white oak, 
and it makes a wonderful for mattress to cover over the ropes so they don't sag so much. My husband always said it was the first sacroiliac board he'd ever seen. And you know, then they gave us a feather bed, so-called, which is just a big quilt of feathers for the cold weather. And in the summer, they used um, the, shuck, the shucks, I guess they're called, of the uh, corn. They were put in. And some people used pine straw. But those, those mattresses were fun to find and see. Then we have a little trunk in that room that's all authenticated. It was brought in. And during the Civil War, by the man who owned it, um, taken off to war with him and so on. And then he, his family gave it to us. Then there's a bed in the Austin house that was given to us for the old station master of Southern Pines and in his family for generations. There were a lovely things that came in that were real. And of course the chimneys being so bad, or the mantelpieces in the two rooms, they could be sold to mom. But it isn't a question of selling, it's a question of preserving that we're doing and the showing so to the public how people live. And I think we all got very excited about that. And so then finally the question came up, they all said, all right, what will we do? Then Talbot Johnson went and tried to get the owners. They had, Hancock couldn't sell his own property because he hadn't paid the federal government's state income tax. So it was in limbo, this property. And we didn't know how many acres to take or how many he would sell. We had a problem. So we began by... The, the cattle were coming in and eating at the house and the horseshoe, all the box bushes, the original box. And they were ruining this place. So we had to spend our first money putting in a fence to keep the cattle out of the house because the, the cattle were using that rolling hill that goes down the bridge. Now you don't use a bridge, you're on a different route. But then we had to pave the road a little bit. We had to spend a lot of money on that put in a fence to keep out those miserable chickens and to move the chicken house cost us several thousand dollars. Well, that was all before we touched the house. And the way we raised that money, you see, this town had always attracted um, our, our, our writers. They all were following Mr. Boyd and the Burtz. So there were many. The Wallace Irwins were here. And Wallace Irwin um, wasn't too well. But his wife said, I will write your brochure. He put out a very smart brochure for raising money for the Historical Society and for the Alston House. And uh, it had a lovely sketch done by a local woman, Ruth Doris Sweat. And um, they had the only big house where the, uh, uh, on Broad Street, lovely house. And they did a great deal of local good. Well, we got money little by little, and I mean little. We never had any grants. We had... For instance, one woman would say, I will re redo the roof of the show house for you. Another said, I will take out that fallen tree. Different things would come along like that. Well, when we got to the Austin house, it was a very serious problem because it was a very well-known house. And all these historians knew about the skirmish during the Civil War, I mean the Revolution. And uh, they knew that Governor Williams had lived there, a very distinguished governor. So that it, it had been a big farm. And a man... Um, had a hunting lodge on the river across from the house and he would rent a room to a man for a day and a night for $150 just to shoot there. And uh, that was a place that in a way protected the Alston property because there were so many people coming and going of the right class of people. Not the people who come in and want to shoot up everything they see, but uh, people who were permitted, had permits to shoot. And he gave us the most wonderful collection of um, arrowheads. And so they're in the Alston house now, in the drawing room. We sent them up to Raleigh, and they were, they were dated as prehistoric. And they're all mounted, and they're put there in that desk in the parlor. Well, to get the money began little by little by little. Then we gave dances. In those days, people were dancing. And we at the country club at Southern Pines, I remember we made money dancing. I can see a, ta a Talbot's son, um, Johnson, dancing with his pretty wife when he was 
and they were so attractive that night. She was in a red dress and had pretty hair. He was in his tux, and they were dancing and whirling around that room, all been decorated by Marge Ewing, and, and oh dear, it was so attractive. And then we get a band down from Chapel Hill from the students, and they would be playing the music. And we'd go out in a draping greens. We never thought of buying anything. We just cut our own greens and took them in. And then we'd put a ladder up and try to climb up to pull off the wallpaper and do all the dirty chores without any money spent. Then Ernest would come down trying to put up a screen door. And, uh, you know, it was just great. We had a lot of fun out of this. So little by little, that house came into our possession. <coughs> Finally, I wrote a book. My brother was, had been run for president, and I can't remember just which year. But I'd gone to make a speech over in um, Greensboro to a, a literary club. And the two men who preceded me on the program were very highbrow. And one was an editor, a famous editor and writer in North Carolina from Warrington. And the other one was Ryan, J.B. Ryan, the parapsychologist from Duke. And they gave these technical speeches, and then I got out and had a lot of fun. I told them about the dress I wore to meet the Queen of England, and how tight it was, and how I couldn't get it fastened when I was supposed to go down and sit beside the Duke or something. <laughs> Ernest being the Consul General at the time in Northern Ireland, and we were having a great time going from big house to big house. So uh, that they came to me, and they said, will you write a book about your brother? So that's why I wrote My Brother Adler. Well, with that money, I gave it to the Alston House because it was sold to the Ladies' Home Journal, the story. And also, a white mink stole for myself. So little by little, you see, money was gathered from all sources. When we got the house, we had to tear off a wing. Also, we had to take off all the covering on the walls. They covered it with modern wallpaper. Then we had to try to scrape it. In one closet, there was the old original red paint. Mm. And that was called horse flesh red or Spanish brown, as, as it was tossed around this shade of red. So we were trying to use that. Then we got an architect from Charlotte named Jim Stenhouse. And he was head of a big architectural firm that big, did big things like hospitals and so on. But he came down and vetted the house. He climbed up in the attic, he climbed around to see, and uh, gave us advice so we could get the local carpenters. Then George Maurice went every day during the time the carpenters were working. He went to South Carolina to get the correct shingles, the red, red, or the correct, uh, cedar shingles, and had those cut. And um, then, you see, uh, one of the owners of that house, either the Wilcoxes or Farley, had torn off Governor Williams' bedroom, which went out from the parlor. And you can see the markings in the wainscoting in the parlor, where the door went down a couple of steps to his room. And he'd also torn off a kitchen wing from the dining room. And there were two steps down to that. And you can see on the chimney the marks of where, where the old paint was for that wing. Now, that would have been in the teens, in the 19-teens, 1900s. And it's actually in the Moore County history, um, the first hundred years, which Blackwell Robinson wrote. It's, he did, describes all of these wings. And we have one picture of this when the two wings were there. The, when the Jones family, who were one of them alive when we bought the house, uh, she told us many things. And Clara Wilcox, here in town, who was Mrs. Harper, Clara Harper. She lived in the house in the summers as a girl. And she's, uh, her brother George could talk about the whole property very, very well. And Governor Williams, of course, left a letter to Mr. Steele when he was trying to sell the place, describing how large the house was, and where his big barns were, and how many slaves, etc. Now, the state owns all that material. Well, we had a wonderful picnics up there. We had wonderful meetings there. Once um, Sarah Hodgkins and Jane McFaul did a little musical program of the period for us, for entertainment. Then another time we had this play that a lady, Mrs. Hume, in Cartridge wrote, telling the story of a group of women of the area sitting on the porch doing the quilting, and they were very worried about the revolution coming and the war. 
and the taxes and so on. So they do their little chat and then somebody sings and so on. It was a very sweet little thing, all down on the porch very informally, but it was very charming. Well, then they were, you know, how it goes with the historical side of their years of when it's really going hot, and then there's a year you cool off, and finally the time has come. Now, well, when it's, um, you know, the Carthage people, we went to Carthage, I knew I was guided to that, because the women during the war had worked, found that they couldn't get much response sometimes in Carthage. They didn't have an entree. I had an entree because of the Shaw House, and the Shaw's being there. And Clyde Shaw, the postmaster, invited me. He said, the best thing I can do for you is to come to talk to a men's lunch club. They meet in this cafe every Thursday or whatever. So I don't know what group they were, so I look back. But I talked to them, and everybody gave a dollar or whatever. One of our very good presidents was um, uh, Mr. Spence, who lived in, in Carthage. And he was manager of great, vast land holdings for different big companies around here. So then you had to get the people in Cameron, and one of them was on our board. She was one of the old settlers. In fact, it was her father who sold the land uh, for Pinehurst. You know, at that small sum, he said to his preacher, oh, on is such charge stand Yankee. I guess the Yankee being Mr. Tufts, a dollar and a half, or whatever he was an acre. <laughs> and then so on. But now, you know, the society, there. Uh, but that group of people who are there at the beginning aren't living. And uh, so you um, you have to cast around for the younger ones. And the younger, among the newcomers, how, where do you put your finger on the one who really cares about history and preservation? Well, there are a few. And so I hope the society can continue. Because after the Alston House, we you see, we realized that this historical society might die because our group was dying off, and then we do the who comes after. So Earl Hubbard had been president several times. He's an excellent businessman, you know, he's at Southern National Bank, and he was very strong and very good. I started the antique show because Miss McIntosh, the antique dealer, um, said she'd give me a list of dealers to write to, and with my touch system, I wrote letters for the first one, the one she guided me to. I seen the antique show up at Salisbury, and th that's a very old town, as you know, an historic town. Well, they were doing an, um, an antique show because they had two houses there they were saving and needed money. And I went to the show and found it wonderful, and ladies all making cakes and pies and things for lunch, and I thought it was fascinating we might do the same, which we did. And then there we are. Everybody's doing an antique show. All over the state, they're they're hurting each other. There's so many, but they're still doing it, and I guess it's okay. It's our only fundraiser now, and the small sum that comes from memberships, and we haven't really organized membership drives as well as we should. This society should be, do a little bit more about that. You know this. Uh, they after we finished the horseshoe and decided to give it to the state, um, uh, we had been all of us wandering these roads in Moore County, and we'd learned a great deal about the um, um, Joel McClendon in the history. There was McClendon Road. We crossed McClendon Creek when we were up above Carthage, and uh, one day I met um, Mrs. Felix Baker whose husband was a retired admiral, and she was living on a little lake near Pinehurst. And uh, I found that her family place was still in existence. And we went up to see it. And here was this wonderful old house with the two chimneys torn about three feet away from the house, leaning away from the house. And the house was in not very good condition. I don't mean it was crumbling, but um, I had been in there to ask about their cabin, which stood about 20 feet from the house with Flora McDonald, who used to take me on all of her home demonstration tours around the county. And if I'd had a tape recorder in those days, I could have gotten some marvelous tales. Um, well, in, in any case, we drove in there, and we found the cabin still intact, but the chimney had fallen completely down. 
So I volunteered to have the chimney put back during the summer while I was away, and they were delighted. Mrs. Baker had been born in that house, and her mother was still living, and I went to meet the mother who was living across the street in property they still owned, because they, had, well, they were large. The Bryant family were the big landowners after Joe McClendon. And then the Bryant daughter, they only had one daughter eventually, and she married a man named Davis. Well, all of her 13 children were born in that house without a doctor, with a midwife attending. And Mrs. Davis was an absolutely fascinating character. She was bright, she was strong, she was well in her 80s when I met her, and um, she couldn't have been more interesting. She always had a gay story to tell you, and her skin was so pretty, and uh, she was just, just a survival type. She had gone through many, many harrowing things, and she had a husband who went to Florida every winter to fish, left her with all her brood, and then would come back in the spring and give her another brood. And it was the most intriguing thing. And here was this beautiful Mrs. Baker, prettiest, chicest little woman imaginable, who'd gone up to Washington as secretary, I think, during the war, and married Admiral Baker, who was a very interesting man, Felix Baker. And he'd been a full admiral. And the last command he'd had a bit of a destroyer called the Randolph. So he named his little daughter Randolph. She is now known as Randy, and she's a darling girl. Well, we, uh, Miss uh, more we talked about the house, it was being very often broken into, because it was not inhabited. And some many men were having hunting parties and drinking parties in the grounds, and were very worried about the property. And I said, I think if you'd give it to the historical society, we could give it some kind of restoration, if you call it that, and, and uh, don't give us too much land, because we can't take care of it. Um, and be fine. So, lo and behold, the Phoenix Bakers agreed. So, Mrs. Baker and her sister, Mrs. Wharton, went with me to the lawyer, Mr. Johnson, who was a member of the society in Aberdeen, and drew up the gift. And they gave us the house if we would maintain it. And I think it was five acres, maybe four and a half, I don't know. But that meant the big house, the, the two story house, and the log cabin. Well, the cabin had, had some brutalizing, because at one time they tried to put electricity in. They had a grandmother one time in there, they had a cooking house, they had to modernize a little bit, so that took a little doing, rip out the modernizing. And then the big house, the big problem, of course, were those two chimneys were pulled away. They had, they had to be put back. And then we, the shutters were gone, but they found under the house two of the old handmade shutters. So they made shutters to match. And then inside, it was mostly just cleaning it up and getting some furniture. Now, we had a, a wonderful luck in our society. You see, all over the state, there were historical societies that were booming. But we had Mrs. John LaBouise, who was a Cameron, uh, a very prominent family in North Carolina. Her, her, they had first come from Virginia and settled in Hillsborough. They're some of the oldest settlements, one of the nicest oldest self-settlements is, and the most protected. And uh, Mrs. La Bouise had restored her father's plantation house. And she invited me several times to spend the night there. She her husband finally died, and she had this enormous plantation. They were the biggest slave-owning family in the state. There was a big marker on the highway. Uh, describing the thousand slaves that lived there. So she said, Buffy, I'm going to give, sell a great many things. And I said, well, it's just the woman I need at this point, because we are storing an old farmhouse, and we need things. She gave us all of the fine artifacts we have at the Bryant McClendon place. Mm -hmm. She gave us the four-poster beds upstairs, and she gave us one of our beds. They say the oldest chair probably they've ever seen it, um, in good condition, and that's in the um, grandmother's room, as we call it, because uh, Mrs. Uh, Davis said her mother is set there before she died. So we call it the grandmother's room, and that little chair is there. So she gave us some really very important things, and we put them right in the Bryant house. Then I bought some things, 
then the David, I said to the David sister, you've got to have some family furniture somewhere to go in this house. Well, they all, the beautiful corner cupboard had been installed in one of the son's houses. I'd seen it there, and they didn't want to remove it, so they didn't. And they bought a bed, and they bought a chest. Very interesting to put in the house. Otherwise, they were gifts. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. We must be very careful in the future not to play with these things. They were, they're a trust to us. And if anybody wants to sell anything, this must be very carefully gone into. The president must know, the membership must know, a committee must do it. It can be, some of these things can go for very, very high prices. We tried very much to have a garden at that house. We thought the ladies at Seven Lakes would take it over because they were so near. And um, they did plant things. And I went to the neighbors in the neighborhood and asked them for plants from their gardens. Two or three of those have lived, but not much, because the man who was the caretaker doesn't water in the summer. And uh, it's been very hard to get a caretaker there. We've had to put that, um, you know, the, the society paid for a trailer. And he is, the man is paid off. He's, so that's, but by the same token, these people who think it's just great to plant this or that, several people gave me shrubs. I come back, it's not there. Mrs. Davis was known as a gardener and a marvelous flower gardener. And um, they say that in the neighborhood, if there was a death, they could always come to Mrs. Davis and she would have flowers to take to the home or to take to the gravesite. They used that the cemetery up north a little bit. But then, actually, we planted, um, I had a companion with me, Mrs. Sinclair, Claire, just after my husband died, and we went up and planted pear trees. Now, they're living, thank the Lord. But uh, Clyde Almond's son at one time planted uh, peaches for us, but they did not live. They were just neglected. So, one has to follow up anything that's planted, I think. 